Hello and welcome to the Old Flyers. Woodland Station is the leased cattle station in the Gascoigne region in Western Australia, once owned by Eni Bain. Eni had served with the 10th Light Horse AIF in World War I and wrote about that in his book, The Ways of Life. On return from the war, he brought a new wife to Woodland Station and set about making a good life for his family. His two sons, Alan and Laurie, and daughter Marion, grew up on the station. In May 1942, 17-year-old son Alan moved his first mob of cattle from Mount Augusta Station to Mikathara, a distance of 386 kilometres. By the age of 24, he was regarded as one of the most reliable overlanders of the Northwest. When he had completed operations for 1949, he had delivered 2,700 cattle from Woodlands, Mount Augustus, Elliott Creek and Gifford Creek stations to Mikathara for railing to the Midland Junction market. The cattle were mainly of Hereford origin. Brahman Cross drought masters came later. Cattle were moved in mobs of about 550 during the cooler months of the year. He has also moved 1,200 sheep from Cobra Station to Woodland Station as well. The stock at the end of each cattle trip were in good condition. Cattle that dropped out were either lame or calving. They would graze there until mustered on a later draft. He said that the last 80 miles of the stock route to Mikathara was the worst, with little feed and water. His total deliveries to Mikathara are by far the largest of any drover. In 1949, he and his outfit had been almost continuously on the road since April. As a young head stockman, Alan drove the last mob of cattle down the Canning stock route to the then railhead at Waluna. Nowadays, cattle are mustered into holding pens, then trucked to market. First, you have to gather them together out of the bush. In the old days, stockmen on horses rounded up the cattle, later aided by motorbikes and modified jeeps known as bull catchers. From the 1950s, aircraft were used to drive cattle towards the stockmen. Jeff Morton of Rosebirth Station in Queensland explains how using his Cessna saves time and effort. Yeah, I use the, uh, the plane almost every day for uh, mustering, uh, checking waters, fences, uh, checking on um, conditions of the land, how much water's about. It's something that's uh, become a very useful uh, tool and that's what you've got to treat it as a tool to work the station with. Ah, well, originally we used to use horses way back as pack horses, uh, which was uh, very time consuming, very expensive. Uh, but time seemed to be of little consequence in those days and then uh, we moved on to bikes and that was a little bit better, or a lot better. A lot better, we didn't need the uh, expertise of the horsemen to, uh, to work the place. To me now, employee pool was a lot bigger. And uh, then we moved on to the plane, which works in conjunction with the bikes, uh, which is very efficient, and I know that my uh, mustering rate is virtually 100% now. That's the greatest thing too, because you can check a fence, you, know, you can check 100 kilometers of fence in half an hour, whereas if you send a vehicle out to do that, 100 kilometers an hour would take you a minimum of one day, probably two days. Uh, this way we can see the, see the damage and send the vehicle directly to the, to the uh, problem area. Laurie Bain, brother of Alan, saw the benefits of aerial mustering too, and for that he would need to learn how to fly. Laurie obtained a pilot's license at the Royal Aero Club in Maylands in 1949 in a DH-82 Tiger Moth at a cost of £120. That would be about $7,600 in today's money. Next problem was to buy an aircraft. A lack of funds meant he wasn't able to purchase an aircraft, so he let his license lap until such time as he could. In 1966, he started looking for a second-hand aircraft and found a 1962 Cessna 182E for $15,000. That would be $141,523 in today's money. It had been owned since new by a Queensland grazier and was in mint condition with only 370 hours total time. 
This was Delta Mike Tango, which became well known in this pastoral countryside. It was accident free, not even a forced landing. During the 30 years that Laurie flew it, only once did the engine cough. He landed on a nearby strip, checked it over, found nothing wrong and kept on mustering. There were few minor hiccups like forgetting to turn the master switch off and finding a dead battery next morning. Who hasn't done that? The engine has been rebuilt or replaced many times and the propeller blades replaced twice due to operating this aircraft on dirt strips where stone chips are common. While Laurie was refueling at Mikathara Airport one day, an airline pilot came over and said, where did you get that aeroplane? Laurie said, de Havilland at Jandicott. The airline pilot said, I know that aeroplane. I taught its first owner to fly a Queensland Grazier when I was with a flying school in Queensland. The registration letters were for his wife, Dorothy May Terry. He was the most meticulous pilot I've ever known. In another twist to the story, Lou Kent, a friend of the Baines, had sold his Cessna 210 to this chap Terry, who in turn traded in Delta Mike Tango to de Havilland at Janicott. Laurie had started his early mustering days as a spotter with well-known aerial mustering pilots John Rulston and Dick Scott. John Rulston spoke about aerial mustering in the Kimberley region of Western Australia in February 2005 when he spoke to the Old Flyers group. Uh, there's a couple up in like the Gascoigne area and they're reasonably quiet because they've been handled more often but they're still pastoral cattle and they live for the aircraft. And up the Kimberleys at the small open range, uh, no fences, of course most stations have a bullet paddock to put the, the bullets in for sale. Um, and then uh, it's um, the only part the wind comes into it is when I've mobbed up the, uh, the cattle and ready to run them into what we call the coacher mob. Uh, the coacher mob are uh, more handled cattle which have already been pre-mustered and held by the, the ground plant. And the plant being the, the men on the horses or the, the Land Rovers or whatever. And uh, it's important to have them positioned downwind from the cattle I'm running in so that the smell from, uh, from the um, horses and what have it, uh, doesn't disturb the cattle which I'm running in and otherwise they can go anywhere. John, did you use a siren? And no, I never had a siren. I did try one early stage, but it doesn't mean anything. I mainly used a, a, a horn, motor horn or something like that, but they didn't do, really do much. It was all for your own frustration. It's something to do with your fingers when you're getting a bit mad, which often happened, and just blow the horn off. John's 28,000 hours of fixed wing mustering may never be exceeded. Laurie was granted an aerial mustering endorsement in 1967, but only to fly on his own property and not below 500 feet. This was a joke because it soon became apparent that unless the plane flew fairly low and made a bit of noise, it was ignored by cattle chewing their cuds by a pool under the shade of gum trees. Some pilots used backfiring to create a noise. It also created a few problems like ruptured mufflers and blown exhaust gaskets. Some fitted car horns to their planes. With the growing acceptance of aerial mustering, people like Laurie were drawn into it, keeping busy mustering on other stations as well. This brought in handy income, but was against Department of Civil Aviation rules, which stated that a private pilot should not fly for hire or reward. In 1988, Laurie received a letter from the Department of Transport Civil Aviation granting him approval to act as an approved pilot for aerial stock mustering. Then, in 1990, he was granted approval as a pilot who may conduct aerial stock mustering training and checking. Laurie's son Miles started flying in 1980 and they both flew DMT for some years. Miles clocked up 3,000 hours in DMT until the family sold Woodland Stations in 2009. DMT was then hangered at Mount Augustus Station with the good grace of the Hammerquist family. In later years, Don Hammerquist suggested to Miles that DMT 
be displayed at the Gascoigne Junction Museum. Laurie agreed and was very happy to have retired her in such a way. It was after the Vietnam War that many returning helicopter pilots went north in Australia into the outback seeking work to employ their skills. The advantages of mustering with helicopters over fixed wing aircraft outweighed their higher cost to buy and maintain. Helicopters earn their keep with greater productivity, blocking and controlling a mob using greater maneuverability at low speeds and the ability to operate in rough country without the need for airstrips. Thank you for watching. Liking and subscribing promotes new content.